Thank you all. I'm very pleased to be here today sharing what we're going to cover in the talk today, how to engage the public um, so that you have an understanding of, of what works, how to craft your message and build relationships. We're going to talk about uh, resources and strategies for engaging the community and some easily overlooked forms of communication. Um, and then, of course, uh, taking it back home and making it stick. So hopefully some of the things that we talk about today are things that you'll be able to actually take back and apply uh, at your organization. I, I do want to point out this quote here under the fancily dressed dog. Um, it's a quote from Richard Avanzino, who um, was a longtime executive director at the San Francisco SPCA and went on to run Maddie's Fund for many years. He has now retired, but of all people I've ever heard talk about engagement and raising funds for an organization, this was the most succinct example I have ever heard. And what he said is, do good things, tell people about it, ask them to help. Now, of course, the devil is in the details, but we will come back to that at the end of uh, the, the presentation today. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in, in a second. I just want to give you a little bit of background to some of the information that I'm going to be sharing today. Um, I was very fortunate to work at Best Friends Animal Society uh, before many people had even heard of it, uh, back starting in 1998 when it was still fairly small and I had the good fortune of working directly for and with uh, Michael Mountain who was the president then and Stephen Hirano and these two guys are in my terms marketing geniuses. I actually think even though I've never heard them formally credited with this that they really revolutionized the way we communicate about animal welfare and uh, by really uh, talking to donors in a very particular voice and engaging them in, in making positive and good things happen instead of showing them all the horrible things that did or could happen, um, that sort of focus on being positive and asking people to be part of making something good happen or continue to happen. And so I have always felt really uh, so fortunate to have had that experience. I worked there for close to seven years and uh, left in 2005 um, and a couple of years later landed at Nevada Humane Society when I heard there was a, an executive director opening there. I thought, oh, how exciting. This is a chance to test what I think can be done. And fortunately, the board uh, gave me that opportunity and so I was able to put into practice a lot of the things that I had learned from uh, Michael and Stephen in a community setting and we really were able to transform not only that organization I think but in part the whole community. Uh, we, I got the job shortly after uh, the previous executive director was terminated for uh, euthanizing a dog and creating a whole lot of turmoil in the community. Um, it could even have been that her decision was right in that particular case, but the way it was handled was clearly not right. And um, it, so the, there was a lot of angst around the Humane Society at the time. They had just partnered with the county and moved into a brand new building that taxpayers had helped to pay for. The Humane Society paid for half of it, but taxpayers had also paid for half of it, which housed animal services and there was a very volatile relationship at the time with the animal services people. It was uh, really um, very challenging, but not only were we able to get our staff going on the right track, we also really were able to engage the pretty much entire community and uh, just get a tremendous amount of media coverage, and some of that is attributable to the size of the community. The bigger your community, the harder it is to dominate news coverage. But every place, everywhere, uh, they love good animal stories. You see them on national news at the end of some newscast because people like them so much. And so um, I just want to share where a lot of what I'm going to be talking about came from so that you'd have some of the background on it. But I want to start off talking about this because when it comes to building relationships, everything matters. I think we know that in our personal relationships. But it's hard sometimes to wrap your head around that when you're talking about a relationship between an organization and the public at large. And everything, every single thing, starts with a first impression. 
So if you start with a bad first impression, you've got a lot to overcome, which is one of the challenges we faced at Nevada Humane Society. But in a lot of cases, people don't have much of an impression of your shelter at all because it's not really well known in the community. Uh, people are confused about what it even is or they don't even know that it exists. So in a weird way, that gives you an opportunity that's at least a clean slate to start from. And one of the things I find is that people frequently underestimate or overestimate how quickly you can form a, a first impression. So how many, think to yourself, how many, what do, you, what do you think? Do you form a first impression in a tenth of a second? Five seconds? Two minutes? What do you, what do you think? So I'm going to show you um, three signs. And I'm going to show them pretty quick. And I want you to just observe your feelings as you see them, because you're going to see them quick. What do you think? What do you think about this one? What's your reaction when you see that one? So what do you think? How quick do you make a first impression? How long does it take? Yeah, really quick. Experts disagree, but everything in blue is what some expert thinks. None of them think it takes, you know, a minute. They all think it's really fast, that our brains are really efficient at this. We make judgments quick. And so uh, you have to keep that in mind in everything that you're doing because everything that happens under your organization's name is creating a first impression for somebody. So first impressions are occurring often before the person even sets foot in your shelter. You have a lovely shelter. Everything could be grand. And people could be wonderful and friendly, but if your messaging that's going out there is off-putting or isn't getting through, uh, the, you, you know, you may as well be doing it in a vacuum. So uh, what we are putting out there into the community is crucially important in terms of the impressions that the public is forming about us before they have even uh, laid eyes on us. And so we actually have a lot more control over this than, than you might think. So it starts maybe even with a welcome sign. I mean, look at these. What's the impression you have when you see them? What is the feeling? The, this is, and it, so therefore it's not easy, but at the heart of it, every single thing reflects on your organization. People are making uh, judgments about the organization. They're perceiving it as, as friendly or welcoming or not so much based on uh, what they see out there. So the next question I have for you to think about is how did you get engaged in this cause? What was it that, um, that got you engaged? So just recall back to when you first got into this thing. Was, was it some statistics that you saw or was it a relationship with an animal? Anybody statistics? Anybody moved by statistics? Well, then you're all pretty much within the norm. Few people are. There are people who like statistics, and there is a place for them. But it is not necessarily the thing that's going to reach people initially. And I think we have, owe it to everybody, since we're using donor money, to have these statistics and to uh, be sure that we're doing good with what people are giving us. But uh, the real motivator for most people, for most causes, is emotions. It's an emotional reaction to animals or an, an animal um, or a relationship to an animal. And so, therefore, that's got to be the primary thing that we are thinking about when we are communicating with people. But this is not an excuse not to gather data. You need that, you need that also. Um, so today, uh, switching gears again, we are in an information overload um, universe. A recent study showed that each of us is bombarded with the equivalent of 174 newspapers worth of information in a day. And that's up from 40 newspapers uh, 30 years ago. So the, it's exponentially increasing the amount of information that we're asked to take in. So when you think about this, um, what is it that is going to allow you and your organization to cut through the clutter? How are people going to notice you? And that, because of this, anything that has, touches an emotion is more memorable. So remember that. That's going to help you. And um, the, 
other thing you have to remember is the sheer volume of impressions that are required. So marketing expert Jeffrey Lant determined from some research some time ago that what he called the rule of seven, and that was that to penetrate somebody's consciousness, you had to actually create uh, at least seven impressions, and, and at that time he said it was within an 18-month period. This was some years back. Other experts are now saying that it even requires more impressions to cut through the clutter. What do we mean by impressions? So it means every time somebody sees or hears about your organization. So it could be online, it could be uh, in the newspaper, it could be on the radio, it could be a poster that they happen to see. And in fact, the more different channels that you're reaching people through, the more effective it is. Um, and so I'd like to view our job as uh, creating positive impressions. If you are in marketing in your organization or if you are the chief executive or on the board, you know, you need to be cognizant of getting the word out there. There is simply something to the sheer volume and if the volume is combined with content that touches people emotionally, um, that is going to be helpful. Um, I know that there is a tremendous focus on social media, and I think it's, um, it's fine. But as those of you who are into it notice, they keep changing metrics on Facebook that sometimes make it harder for nonprofits to get the edge. And, and I think there is still a huge place for conventional media. For one thing, it, it gives you a lot of credibility. If you can point out an article done by a reputable reporter or journalist, that is an objective opinion of your organization as opposed to something you posted yourself on Facebook. Now, admittedly, you don't have as much control over the content. However, many reporters are, um, are animal people, not all of them, but many of them. And uh, building those relationships, uh, and it is a two-way street. The media is looking for news. They're looking for stories. And if you become a reliable source of information for them and a source of good stories, including feel-good stories, uh, you will become as, uh, you know, someone that the media actually looks to reach out to when there is an animal situation in your community. But it requires being available. When I have interacted with people who they don't, they don't pay, reporters call and they're nervous, they don't want to talk to them, they put them off. I, if I, I had as many of their phone numbers in my cell phone as I could and I gave them my cell phone and if I saw it was them, unless I was in a crucial meeting, I picked up immediately to talk to them because responsiveness, that's what a relationship is about, right? Being responsive to each other. And um, you can, you know, they do not owe you favorable news, but, but the best way that we can ensure that they're at least going to hear us out. And if there's something critical, if someone's calling them and complaining about you and they have your phone number in their cell phone or their contacts, the chance that they'll call you and give you a chance to at least give your side of the story is, is greatly improved. So the relationship, building relationships with the media is, is very important. You now getting back to those impressions, I uh, want to talk about why I think it is so important that animal welfare organizations market themselves relentlessly. And um, often people are skeptical about that, especially people who have a lot of marketing experience feel that you don't want to over bombard the media with stuff. And, and yes, you do not want to bombard them with you know, meaningless stuff. I would agree with that. However, think about the and, and it isn't just media, there's, you know, there's advertising, including free advertising you may be eligible for, but invest some money in advertising your organization. That's what successful businesses do. It's not money thrown away, it's money invested in the future of your organization if you do it wisely and ask for your nonprofit discounts. Um, you should have an advertising and marketing budget in your annual operating budget. So what do we have in common with mattress sales and car sales? Um, and I would suggest that it's actually infrequent contact. So most people obtain a mattress, I think it was every eight years, and a car every five to 10, or maybe I have that backwards, but they're not, these are, it's not like milk, where you're going to the supermarket and buying milk. And when was the last time you saw an ad for milk in the newspaper anyway? They don't exist, why? Because they have a built-in market, you have to go get the milk, people think anyway. So the difference is these are, they're acquisitions that are expensive and, and 
while animals may not be expensive, they are an investment in your time, and actually most people realize that. So we are an infrequent purchase, so to speak, or an infrequent contact, especially when you're thinking about pet adoption or spay neuter, whatever services people might be interacting with us for. Now you might think because we're only going to buy a mattress every 10 years that we'd only hear from them very intermittently, but on the contrary, we hear from them constantly. Every street corner has somebody flapping a sign for the car dealer or the mattress. They're in every Sunday paper virtually every week with a big ad trying to desperately to get your attention. And I don't think it's because they think you're going to buy more mattresses and cars. I think it's because they want to be top of mind when you are ready to buy a mattress or a car. And that is how we should be thinking about elevating the status of animals and the consciousness of our community and elevating the awareness of our organization. We need to stay top of mind and we need to be relentless in getting out the message to our community. And uh, that can, as I said, take many forms, which we'll, um, we'll talk about. So we already talked about whoops, emotion over facts, but I want to share one little tip that Stephen Hirano had shared at Best Friends. He was one of the, the lead, among other things, photo editor person. And he would look at photos, and he would say that he was looking for the, the awe factor. And what he meant by that was when he showed it to someone, he wanted them to go, oh, that's so cute. Or, oh, that's so touching. That's what he was going for. He wasn't going for that they were upset or alarmed or unmoved. He was actually looking for them to think that this was to, for, to elicit an emotional reaction that was m generally more or less positive and interested. And I think that is a good photo test when you are looking at photos to use to represent your organization in a brochure. Are they fuzzy? Are they blurry? Can you see the animal's eyes? Are you making an emotional connection? If not, get better pictures. Don't just settle for some crappy photo that you happen to have of an animal that looks about the size of a postage stamp sitting on a couch. It needs to be able to make an emotionally resonant reaction and, and time and money spent and you don't need to spend a lot of money because there's volunteer photographers who would love to help you in your community. You just have to ask for them. I guarantee they are out there and you'll get great photos and it will be worth every minute of time that you spend on it. The other one is storytelling. Um, humans, I think we're just hardwired for it. Think about before we had uh, a, a press or a written language, you know, we sat around and told each other stories and these were passed down through generations. I think it's just hardwired in here. We love stories. So look for the stories and tell the stories. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. For example, this story uh, was this kitten was pulled out of the back of a fireplace vent thing and covered and said it looked like a black kitten and this animal control officer rescued her and cleaned her up and there she is in her new home. So the, getting the photos that tell the story requires training everybody to watch for the stories. And because we were doing this so much at Nevada Humane Society, the folks at Washoe County Regional Animal Services began to notice and they began spotting the stories and telling us because this animal control officer told us about this and we were able to get there and get the actual photos, not of the rescue unfortunately, but, but of the kitten once it arrived at the shelter. So Andy Goodman is a wonderful guy to check out online. He uh, does, he has a nonprofit organization that's really focused on nonprofit communications. He has a great free booklet you can download called Why Bad Ads Happen to Good Causes and Why Bad Presentations Happen to, I don't know, great books though. And they're just free on his website. And he has a great newsletter called Free Range Thinking. I, urge you to check it out. And he's a real advocate for storytelling and he talks about how to tell effective stories. So I, I like to include what he has to say here. And once you start to notice just the compelling nature of, of storytelling, a police officer's driving through town, he happens to notice in an empty field a bunch of milk crates all stacked up. And he goes to look at them. What is it? It's cats sealed up in milk crates. He brings them to the shelter, we get photos, we call the press. It's a huge deal. It goes on the Reno Gazette Journal website and hundreds of people start looking at the pictures. 
Now the paper loves us because, hmm, gee, a lot of people are interested in seeing what the Humane Society does. So let us know the next time something happens. So you, you build these relationships by watching out for the stories and getting them out there in a timely basis. Um, you know, and I have a few tips here for finding a good story. Um, ask questions of your staff. Get out of your chair and walk around and see what's going on and ask them. It takes time to train people to tell you stories because to the vet tech and the veterinarian and the person in admissions, this is just every day. Every day they're getting animals in. They don't think, oh, this is an important story that I have to tell someone about. You need to, to train them to get you and to get you early and to get you engaged in the story. Um, but asking questions helps them. It, it became a thing we did in every manager's meeting. Let's talk about the stories. And over time, people begin telling you sooner and sooner when they spot the stories themselves. And they feel good because they're contributing and, and their work's being appreciated and recognized as well. Um, there's another great book with this one too, available to download. It's by Capacity Canada. And it, it's for nonprofits, Canadian nonprofits, but the same thing uh, from my look at it would work for us. It's a great uh, resource for you to look at. But there's no, story of shortage, uh, no shortage of story ideas that you can pull on for your organization. Of course, whenever you're trying to engage anybody, be it with a story or whatever, you want to consider the audience. Uh, these public officials, they are going to be uh, boatloads more interested in the data than uh, the average person. And I hope you'll indulge me. I'm going to play a very silly video clip for you. <laughs> That illustrates what I think happens with a lot of our messaging. We tend to want to lecture people. Maybe it's because we unfortunately get to see some of the unfortunate things that happen to animals, so maybe we can be forgiven for that. But you know, we want to urge people to be a responsible pet owner. Or I've even heard people say, well, we'd like to educate the community. And they tell a report of that. And what is the implication that the community is a bunch of dopes? Um, you know, think about the words that you're saying. And when we talk about pet adoption, we say, this is a very serious commitment. And are you ready to make a serious commitment? Do you really think of your pet? You look at your pet and you think, there's my commitment? No, we think about. You know, we think about love and joy and that they live in the moment and that this gives us something and that we, uh, we feel rewarded by having them in our lives. And so why don't we talk about that instead of the others? Yes, there are some horrible people who are irresponsible, but this is not the mass of people. It's the minority of people. And we just happen to see more of them than the average person, perhaps. But let's not focus on that. So think about your language. Is it, is it understandable? You know, when people say, I have a, a GSD or a DSH that needs a home, what does it even mean? You know, so don't, don't use jargon. Talk about, um, talk about what the person cannot see in the photo, the great photo that you're going to show of these animals. Talk about their personality and what's cool and unique about them and the rewards of, of, um, of being with animals. Um, you know, touch people's hearts and don't tell them, you know, to it. Then I see people who they sort of take this to heart and they start saying, he, he's perfect, P-U-R-R-F-E-C-T, or he's, or it's potastic. You know, I'm sorry, but that's like hype. That's not... Just let us decide that it's potastic. Don't tell me that. Tell me about what's cool about this animal or this event and why I should be there to support the Humane Society or the Spay Neuter Clinic. Be genuine, like a genuine person, and talk about real feelings as opposed to silly catchphrases. And, you know, I, I, I hate. We're looking for a forever home. Well, I want to meet the person who can guarantee the forever home because it's really something none of us can guarantee. I mean, I could be hit by a bus tonight and my pets won't have a forever home. Does that mean I never should have adopted them? It doesn't make any sense. So think about what it is that you're saying. Is it condescending? Is it goofy? You know, think it through before we say it. And, and yes, there is a small audience of us, people who are crazy about animals who 
love to see the cutesy stuff, but, but we need to reach beyond them. We've already reached the people who love to see the potastic post. We need to reach the people who, who have a full life and that animals are a part of it and that we want them to value them more. We don't, we don't want them to join a, some kind of silly club or something. So think, think carefully about what words you're using. Um, a few tips for your communication pitfalls. Find an editor, and it, maybe it should be someone who isn't as crazy about animals as you are. You know, before you put something out there, I would, I try never to put anything out there that at least one other person who I trust has, has read, because it's so easy to make a mistake, and it reflects on you. And yes, I'm sure one of you will find a typo or something. But I really try hard and urge others, find an editor. Um, and, and get feedback, you know, from, uh, as I said, from outside that circle. Uh, and I love this quote from Peter Drucker, one can communicate only in the recipient's language or in their terms. And I, I hope you can see the cat cartoon because this woman is telling the cat to stop clawing the furniture and the cat here is exactly what? Nothing. And that's unfortunately what I think happens with some of our communication too. We're not thinking about the recipient of the message. And this gets back to things like, you know, we may be trying to reach a segment of the community. Well, maybe we should have more folks in that community working in our, our organization and making an effort to do that. So um, anyway, enough about that. Another thing I want to talk about is that experience that people have in your shelter. Now, be it pet adoption or spay neuter, um, that interaction that people have with your organization is furthering that impression that they have of you. A and I would like to suggest that their experiences with us ought to be great. They should not be mediocre. They should not be where they feel bad because, you know, the adoption, you, you acted like the Gestapo interrogating them, um, you know, having to call six people and get references and come to their home because we're sure that they're bad people. Um, I understand there's reason sometimes where we have to do some checking sometimes. But, you know, really the trends are away from that in animal sheltering and to, towards a more uh, open adoption process and what they re research has shown that what makes a successful adoption is some knowledge of animal behavior that bond so letting the person bond with the animal we all know we put up with all kinds of stuff from people and animals we love right so if the person loves that animal that's what we want so you can create that love relationship and let that bond form in your shelter by the time they go home you don't have to worry so much and um, anyway, just focus on making that experience great. We all see adoption as old hat. At Nevada Humane Society, we could easily have 50 adoptions in a single day. But to the people coming in, each of those individual 50 people, this may be their only experience adopting a pet in the next 10 years. So that impression that they create, and people who are unhappy, they tell way more people than people who are happy. So if you want a good reputation, try very hard to make everybody happy because the one unhappy person, they're going to you know, they'll be out there complaining. Now, I'm not suggesting that you lower uh, standards of a decent home. No, we want animals to be in a decent home, absolutely, but I think we can do that and still create a fantastic adoption experience for people. Uh, you know, in simple things that we would have, we had a bell hanging up and when each adoption was completed, we'd ring the bell and everybody would stop and clap and the person would go out the door feeling like a hero. They were being applauded for adopting a pet. And it, it really, it, it was great for all of us. It made us all feel good every day as opposed to, you know, stressed. For one second, you get to put that out of your mind and focus on something really good happening. Um, I, I absolutely love this quote and uh, feel that at the heart of it is really something about the kinds of people we want to be hiring and the kinds of people we want to inspire to volunteer with us. Because, you know, good feelings really, uh, they really do multiply. And if people, a lot of people have lives that are frustrating and um, we're fortunate that we have jobs that actually matter. Some people have jobs that they find quite tedious and 
and, and not at all rewarding. And so everyone, or many people at least, are looking for meaning in life. And we have something that is meaningful that we get to do every day. And so we have lots to be enthusiastic about and lots to share. And keeping that in mind when you're uh, communicating with the public can go a very long way. Think about things like what we call ourselves. We call ourselves the shelter. And I'll tell you what it sounds like to me is a place where you bring the animals. You bring them and you put them in the shelter. But maybe that's what we shouldn't be. Maybe we should be, someone suggested this term to me, welcome to your pet adoption and resource center, so that we start to think differently about what we do rather than just as a place where you bring animals that you don't want, although I hope there's always someone willing to do that too. Logos, think about the way they convey, what they convey about your organization. These are two redesigned logos, and I think in both cases, they're an improvement on, on what they were before. I mean, you sort of look at the city of Jacksonville, and there's not, you know, really no animal in sight, and when it was redesigned, it's just so much more upbeat looking, and um, I think it begins to model how they wanted the officers to be in their community. Now, I already talked about this a little bit, about a picture. Um, and that it matters, and, and that everyone on your team is not going to be a great photographer. But you do need an editor, somebody who's looking at what they're putting out there. I'm going to show you two pictures off Facebook for pet adoption, to promote pets for adoption. Do you think that this, many people are going to come in for this poor little guy who you can't see his face, and he's smeared poop or food or something everywhere, which might be in your living room if you adopt him? I mean, it's just not doing him any any favors. And, and so this guy, I mean, you think, wow, whoever took his picture and put him up on Facebook, I think he's going to be adopted in two minutes. So think about which pictures you allow to be put out there. And I actually think there may be cases where no picture or just take the poor dog out of the kennel and get a decent picture. You know, um, volunteers will do it if you, if you let them. This is a photo of Charlottesville Automobile SPCA. So now I think it definitely has Stephen's awe factor. You'll, I'm sure you'll agree. And that was a postcard they sent out to recruit uh, foster caregivers. There are times when you can even be a little bit edgy. We did a thing in Reno. These were ads that we paid to run in the Reno Gazette Journal um, about real men love cats. It was fun and silly and, and drew some attention. They were run as a series. Um, we did a promotion in conjunction with the casino, and so these, this looks like the ads you see in the Reno paper every day for the casinos, except most of them don't have a dog and a cat in them. Around the elections, we ran this in the newspaper, and you can copy the, please steal this idea. Um, it is not copyrighted, and you can do it, it's coming, there's one coming up this fall, you know. Um, and it is one thing that people on both sides of the party do, you know, there's animal lovers, Republicans and Democrats alike. Even spay-neuter, I think, can be made interesting and fun. <laughs> um, another part of engaging the community is having cool events that look like fun, that are fun, that draw big audiences, that engage a lot of people in the community. Uh, these were two of them that we did, but you can have your, your own and really work at growing them and making sure that the event itself is loads of fun because if it is fun, people will tell their friends, the media will love it, there'll be lots of photos about it on, you know, after your event is over. Um, even events in the shelter we tried to make fun and silly. We did um, an ancient Egyptian theme thing uh, when dogs and cats were kings or something, and that was Bark Antony and Cleopatra there. Um, so we tried to partner with businesses and do things that sounded and looked like fun. Um, this is a very silly idea. We copied it from another June shelter. June is Adopt-A-Cat Month at Nevada Humane Society, and it looks like someone left on the cat-making machine. We've got new models, old models, cute cats, ugly cats. Looking for pep? We've got that. Or just a lazy cat to cover up the hole in the couch? Got that too. Calico cats, Siamese cats, short-haired cats, long-haired cats, fat-haired cats, spotted cats, striped cats, white cats, black cats, even a few scratch and dead models. You name it, we've got it. They need to find a home, your home. Adoption fees is waived for all adult cats during June. Come on down to the Nevada Humane Society and take one of these guys home today. Pretty silly, but it, um, it got attention and people laughed and noticed. 
you know, be out there in the community. If there's empty storefronts, you can do pet adoption center in them. Just ask them if you can use it. And it gets pets out in front of an audience of people that might not think about adopting before. Um, uh, also, be sure that you have programs that are going to meet the genuine needs in your community. I really liked this one at Philadelphia Animal Care and Control because it said if you found a cat, you could adopt it for free. They called it safe at home. So if you brought in a cat, they would spay and neuter the cat and give it vaccines and give the kitty cat back to you for free. And they thought that was much preferable to them taking the cat in where the cat may end up getting sick or being euthanized and felt that was a worthwhile investment of their funds. It's a, it's a great program. This is in um, Los Angeles Animal Services, or actually was at the time the photo was taken a year or so ago. Um, it, the goal was to help people who were coming in to surrender to think about if there was another way. Now ideally we're reaching people before they get to the shelter door, but this is still very good and they were successful in, in you know, if, if the dog was, they were surrendering the dog because he kept escaping, volunteers would go out and patch up the fence. You know, if they were surrendering the cat because it had some medical problem they couldn't pay for, they had a fund and they would pay for it and return the, the pet. Um, I, I just want to, I want to go quickly through this, but it's just the concept of building relationships in your community. And don't wait until you need a segment of people to help you. Especially, this is true with uh, local officials. You do not want to wait until you have a situation where you need their help. You want to reach out first. So they should know you as the director of the Humane Society or the SPCA. Um, because when there is a problem, when a constituent comes to complain or, or if you're the head of animal services, they should know you uh, because you want them to come to you first before they jump to conclusions and assume anything. Um, and if you really need help, they can really, just one phone call, you, these are folks with lots of connections. And the power of a heartfelt thank you, you know, think about, a lot of groups make decisions about who's going to get thank you letters and they decide that they're only going to send them to people who give certain amounts of money. And I get it, you know, it costs money to put a stamp on an envelope and send it, but it doesn't cost that much email somebody and it doesn't cost much to have volunteers help you fill out the, the letters to send back. You know, for the, for the little old lady or man that puts a dollar in the envelope and sends it to you or puts in a, a paper bag of cat food, everyone's been handed one of those, I assume, um, that could have meant a lot more than someone who wrote you a $100 check. It could have represented a much bigger sacrifice. And interestingly, sometimes I've seen these people put the Humane Society in their will and you get their entire estate, which may not be millions, but it's something if it's a house. And, you know, think about those. It's, it's about relationships and what are we modeling? Are we trying to, you know, it, to me, I think it's worth the cost of reaching out to somebody who gives you a small thing because our job is about encouraging compassion and kindness. And so that's part of our job. And so to me, it's just a no-brainer that we thank everybody that gives us anything of, of really any value at all in some way, even if it's just an email or, or a hearty in-person thank you. I've seen people bring in things and, and, you know, the folks at the adoption desk go, okay, thanks, plop, and the poor person is left standing there. Well, they thought about bringing that thing into the Humane Society. They think it's going to be useful to you. So take two seconds, look them in the eye, and say, thank you so much. This is so great for the dogs and cats. Thank you. The next time they feel the impulse to help, they're going to help. You, if, if you, have you ever had that experience where you did something you thought was good, and the other person's like, eh? You know, it doesn't make you want to do it again, does it? So, we, we need to really think about that and carefully train our staff. Uh, this was one year where we had a goal to increase spays, public spays and neuters, and that's the number that the clinic had achieved, and um, they all got T-shirts that, that had the, you know, the dog and cat on it, and it said 800. We copied this from another group. It was a little edgy for me, but we went with it. Uh, you know, the number of spays and neuters they did, and it said, that takes balls. They loved it. The clinic was thrilled over the moon with these t-shirts, and we took their picture. And um, it, was, 
it's fun. So recognize the staff when they achieve goals. It's one of the great things about having an adoption goal or a spay neuter goal. You can do something fun and recognize everybody. And if you don't have it in the budget, you know, tell the volunteers or the board members that this is what you want to do and ask them to help make it happen. This is just another quote that really reinforces the customer service piece of it. And I think uh, sometimes um, when people think about customer service, they think, well, who, who is the customer? And think about it, who is the customer? Is it the animals? Is it people? Are the donors? The visitors? Is it the staff? Is it the volunteers? Is it this amorphous community? Who, who is it? Oh, yeah, I think it's got to be all. And so, um, you, know, and the, you know, think about your staff, the way you treat your staff. If, if they feel taken advantage of or that everything is crappy and there's, we, you know, this place is just dismal and no fun, that's, it's going to be really hard for them to represent to the public a good face. So, so really, customer service starts at every level and impacts everybody. And when you think about, you know, what does customer service feel like to you? You know it when you get it, and you know it when you don't. So think about what it looks like, and, and maybe have this discussion with staff at some point. It's a great thing for different managers to talk about with people. What does it feel like when you get good customer service? And what does it feel like when you don't get it? And this, too, to me, is, is one of the important things that you can begin to instill as a value. So, um, retail stores are pretty good at this, and I find that people who have worked in retail or the restaurant industry are great people in sheltering most of the time. And it's because it's very fast-paced, and you can't rest on your laurels, and the, um, the element of customer service is, is a really big one. You're not going to be successful otherwise. And so, you know, when we think about how often you hear people in sales say, no, we can't do that, or no, that's not allowed. Um, you know, try rather to find a way to redirect it so that you can talk about what you can do to help rather than, you know, say no. Um, and train people for that. It it's, requires a little effort, but, you know, once everyone starts thinking creatively about, so how could we handle this situation where we have to tell people, no, we can't do that? What, what alternatives are there? Is there some other way you can help if you can't do what they're actually hoping that you can do, which sometimes we can't. Um, and this makes a huge difference. Just train everybody to smile. You can even hear the difference on the telephone, whether people are smiling or not. Um, this is a great quote, too. And, and so it gets to subtle things like tone and intent that people pick up on um, in conversations. And it's a little harder to train. Um, but it can be rewarded when it's done well. Uh, we had implemented the three-second rule for greeting people when they walked in. Wells Fargo had it in place, for, at least for a while. Verizon also. Uh, certainly Walmart, when you walk in, there's a person there who greets you at the door. Uh, volunteers can do that function, and it's a great, great thing to do, um, at least during the busiest times at your shelter. One thing I want you to think about is to go back and walk through your shelter and think about all of your five senses and how you feel when you walk through the shelter. So this is a shelter. These are two different shelters, actually, that we visited. And this is the first impression when you walk up outside. Um, that was it, you know, licenses, vector control. These are animal shelters where they do adoptions and spay neuter. But this is what's outside. This is also outside and inside various shelters, shelters that were prepared for an assessment, incidentally. They were expecting people to come and check out the shelter. Contrast it with these, you know, where the shelter is clean and free of clutter and it's, you know, well lit. Take a look at these signs. These are real signs I've seen on the walls of shelters. They look crappy. The messages are kind of crappy, like this, they even have like a vicious looking dog on one of them and rules on pit bulls and oh my goodness. Um, this cat has fangs sticking out. I mean, it just doesn't send the message we want, apart from the fact that they're crumpled and wrinkled and, you know, go through your shelter with a critical eye and tear all these things down when you see them. Instead, you know, we, have, we would have volunteers come in and do 
painted decorations on the windows in the shelter that made a really festive atmosphere. These are various photos from various shelters with, you know, where they really make an attempt to decorate the rooms for themes, for holidays. Think about the smell in your shelter. It can be really hard in an old shelter with a poor HVAC system. Uh, but if you have a recent shelter and it smells bad, it's not the shelter, it's not the HVAC system, it's the cleaning and the shelter. And you really want to do whatever you can uh, to fix that. Um, even we would serve refreshments to keep people in the shelter and invite them in just for an event that's fun. Like if you're going to have an art exhibit in the shelter, it brings artists to the shelter. They may not come otherwise. Um, you know, Cupcake Day was engaging a whole ton of different bakers. It was an event that we'd borrowed from someone in New Zealand or something who did a, a shelter there that did a similar event and engaged bakers from all across the community. And think about ways to, that you can engage individual uh, constituencies. Allowing people to touch the animals is a big one. Um, if you sit in on some of Kelly's talks, you'll know that you don't want to be having aggressive and dangerous dogs on the adoption floor. So it's not such a risk to allow people to interact with the dogs. And that's the best way we bond as humans, touching that that one-on-one -on -one interaction. That's how people fall in love and adopt animals. And you know, having processes and thing, having an efficient organization that runs well, there's really no substitute for that. And uh, people do notice. And in terms of trying to empower staff to make good decisions, we had put early on four guiding principles for staff into place. And these were intended because you just can't always have a supervisor there. They're, there are times when no one's available and the person has to make a decision. So we want to guide their decisions. And these are the four things that we came up with. Create life-saving solutions for animals. Involve the community in our work. Deliver co quality customer service. And provide excellent care to the animals. And we did fall down on these things, I can assure you. But they were our aspiration and what we tried to do. And we also told staff that if they made a decision trying to support one of these things and were able to explain that, that they would not be in trouble for a decision that they made. So if somebody made a decision to, you know, take in an animal that we weren't expecting, or that, that was okay because they were trying to create a life-saving solution. And if you can give guidelines like that and then stand behind them, that if someone's doing it with a good intent, you're going to figure it out. Uh, that, that's a very good thing. Now, just to wrap up, I want to talk about taking this stuff back home. Uh, I have a retail background, and this was on the door of every back door, right at eye level, when you walked out into the sales floor from any door in the building. And it's just such a great saying. And especially since we figured out that customers are everybody, right? Um, it's really, to me, helpful. It's something that I keep in mind. Um, I, I'm not sure if anybody remembers management by walking around. It's an old concept from the 80s. So if you're young, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. But it's a great concept for animal shelters. And you know, get out from behind your desk, have a scheduled time that you're going to do this, and walk through and talk to your staff and talk to the people who are there. Even if you only have 30 minutes a week to do that, it just gives you a whole different insight. And you'll begin to see Maybe staff is missing some critical piece of equipment that they need. Um, maybe somebody's doing an outstanding job and you had no idea. And the only way to do it is to get out from behind that desk. And it's really, it's hard sometimes because I know how busy you are. I've been there. But seeing it with your own eyes, there's absolutely no um, substitute for it. Uh, and really, just it's, it becomes a habit and becomes a great experience. I also have a checklist for a shelter walkthrough, and what I would do when I would do it would be to step outside the front door and try to pretend I had never been in this building before and look at every detail. Are there fingerprints on the door? Is there crap laying in the corner, cigarette butts or old cans? Or is the dog poo plastic thing filled with bags? Like I would try to look at everything like I was here for the first time and notice clutter and notice crap on the floor, on the walls. 
you really, it's a discipline. You really have to work hard at it because we are, our brains are good at tuning it out because otherwise it's just information overload. But train yourself to do that and you can train your staff. Take one of them with you when you do one of these walkthroughs and begin to train them to see it as well so that you can make sure that the shelter is, is clean and, um, and, and that everyone's representing the organization the way you would want it to. And it's a great, so you'll see people doing great things and amazing things happen. It's just that we get stuck in our office all the time. Um, storytelling, you know, start doing storytelling about your organization. Uh, we used to do, start off every manager's meeting with what I called one good thing because it was so easy to think of all the problems that we had. And um, sometimes stories would come out of that because somebody would say some remarkable thing that had happened somewhere in the shelter and you would have had no idea because we're all just so busy doing whatever part of this big organization is ours. So if you can take storytelling back to your organization in some way that you begin to gather the stories, people feel so good about it. You know, it really it's like a kudo for the staff when they uh, get an article in the paper about their great work or, um, or, or just to be featured in something, you know, a picture of them helping an animal or something. It's, um, it's, it's a great way to reward the staff. And to really just create a culture where we're constantly looking at how are we doing? You know, there's all kinds of ways you can do that. This is just a few uh, beginning possibilities uh, for things that you could do uh, with folks on the team. And I'm going to close with Richard Avanzino's wonderful statement uh, that I think is just so very true. Do good things, tell people about it, ask them to help. And when you ask them to help, remember to be specific. The more specific your request the, um, the more likely it is that someone will fulfill it. And that is counterintuitive because we tend to think if we just say volunteers needed, that the volunteers are going to flock. But they don't know what it means. They see it and they go, hmm, the Humane Society needs volunteers. Hmm, I wonder what that means. But if you were explicit and you said, we need people to help walk dogs and brush cats and someone to help with data entry, that's really super specific. We need someone to come in and take pictures of the dogs or the cats. or it's so specific that they can see themselves maybe doing it. Or it's clear that they're not going to do it, but you're not going to get more people by being generic about things. And you know the same is true with a difficult animal to adopt. When you have one that's tough to adopt, tell that animal's individual story. You only need one person whose heart is touched and feels like that's a situation they could, they could embrace. OK, well, thank you all so much. I appreciate it.